Welcome to Ask When, everyone. This, I pay one of you now, is going to be a soapbox episode because I have a person who kind of speaks my language. I have Miss Jody with me. How I met Miss Jody is through Betsy Wizzle. Betsy Wizzle has been a previous guest. She's coming back in January. I was also on her podcast, Chats with Betsy. I said to Betsy, do you know anyone? And this is how Jody and I came across to meet each other. And Jody does, I hate to say it, but she does something that I don't want to do. I have a little bit of experience with it, as you guys know, but I don't want to do it all day in, all day out. She is a caregiving coach. And what that means is she helps family members find caregivers or find nursing homes for their loved ones. And the reason why I am so goddamn passionate about this, and excuse my French, I flew one of you guys that it was going to be a soapbox episode. The reason why I'm so goddamn passionate about this is because if you've been hanging around with me for a little while, you know my story. You know my story of losing both my parents um, 10 years apart, one in 2019 and one in 2010. Both, um, my dad was going to take care of me after my mom died. That was a interesting show in itself, God love him. But um, yeah, it's a fine line. <laughs> it's a fine line. And since I've moved that down to Arizona, I've gotten stabilized, but I did it on my own card. No one suggested that I move down to Arizona. They suggested that I sell a house, but it was my choice to decide where I wanted to live. Arizona popped up. I was 99% positive I was moving to the East Coast and buying my own house and uh, managing my own care that way, how I did it for many, many years, was help by myself now. But then Arizona pops up and it just, yeah, it was just a better situation and I'm blessed to be down here. It will be, be almost two years, me being down here, but without further ado, and yes, it's gonna be a soapbox episode. I'm gonna let Jody take it away. All right, thank you so much, Wynn, for having me. It is my pleasure to be here, and I have enjoyed so much just getting to know you a little bit better. The passion that you have is just phenomenal and I'm getting covered in goosebumps right now just because I because of the connection we have. So I too am so passionate especially my passion really stems from those people who need care. That is my that is my passion. I want to do everything I can to help that person. So I am a geriatric consultant, and I'm going to give you just a brief history about where I've come from and, and how I ended up right here with you today. Yeah. So I started out um, probably, you know what, I've been a social worker my whole life. Uh, not licensed, of course, but you know what, when I remember being three, four years old and playing in a group of kids, and if I was really enjoying a toy, and if I would look over at you and think, gosh, I think Win would like to play with this toy, I would get up and go give it to you. And then in elementary school, I was that kid that would sit across from you at the lunchroom table and look in my lunchbox and kind of look over at you and say, oh, look, at Wynn doesn't have a chocolate chip cookie today. I would look in there and say, Wynn, would you like my cookie? Yeah. That's just how I, how I grew up. So I finally then did go to college, became a, a certified social worker. 
and began my career in the nursing home setting. And it was there in that nursing home setting that I fell in love with the geriatric population. And at that, at that time, I coined the phrase, I love those who lived ahead of me. So much to learn from them, so much to glean. But then, you know what, I moved and then I came to uh, the place where I reside now in the city where I am now, and I became a hospital discharge planner. Now, I don't know what you know about hospital discharge planning, mm -hmm. but it's rough. I know a little bit too much about hospital yeah. yeah, and a little bit about too uh, much about hospital discharge, stay uh, hospital discharge, myself and my dad had to get into it. And my dad, when he was getting diagnosed, the day of his biopsy, we, um, and people don't know this story, but I'll tell it publicly now, but the day of his biopsy, we get down, he's a number, a long story, but I'll share it quickly. Long story, he came home for nine days and I landed being the caregiver the nine days he was there because my stepmom was at work. My stepsister was trying to help my stepmom. Yeah, big show, big interesting show. And I couldn't um, do the work that I wanted to do because I was so focused on him and long story short. But um, during his, when he was transferred to Big Big Hill Hospital, which is four hours away from us. It was Mayo Clinic, mind you. It was a teaching hospital. And we get a call. We get down there. We get a call in our hotel room saying from a nurse saying that Mr. Charles wants out. And we're like, okay. And I remember my stepsister talking to this nurse on the phone. And she goes, we don't have the capability to take him home. He's not, di he's not diagnosed yet, and yet he wants out. And so I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go on this wild goose chase. And if it wasn't for a oxygen specialist to come in to look at his stats, I don't think he would have been diagnosed because with stage four lung cancer, because they were taking so long to diagnose him. And finally the oxygen specialist goes, he doesn't look good and we're not releasing him even though he wants to be out. And so, yeah, yeah. I've had yeah. my experiences of my own discharge and um, my own father's discharge. My mother died in the hospital, so she didn't get discharged. She got admitted though. But discharge is tougher than admitted. And you hear all these people say, we're waiting on the discharge paperwork. Well, when you hear, we're waiting on the discharge paperwork, a lovely person like Jody has to go do that. <laughs> and basically what they do is hand you your directions for home or hand you the directions for the next place you're going to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? When I did that job for 15 years, absolutely loved every patient. And I'm going to tell you this about me. So I never, and I can say never, walked into a patient's room without the thought in my head, that's my relative lying in that bed. Now, I'm going to be honest and tell you, I don't necessarily like all of my relatives, but because you're a part of my family, you're going to get special treatment. You're going to be treated like family. So just like some of my patients, some of them were, were a little more challenging to, to like. You know, they were a little gruff and a little rough around the edges, but I still thought of them as family. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. But the the hospital rules and the Medicare regulations would not allow me to serve my patients and the families the way they deserve to be treated. Yeah. And I I looked up, I, I was fortunate enough that I, I could walk to work. I lived close enough to the hospital that I walked every day. It was about a mile to work. And one day I looked up and I said, wow, I am a slave to that building. I'm not helping anyone. So what I did is I decided to take my very specialized skill set and bring it to the public. And that's how I became an independent geriatric consultant. And as a geriatric consultant, I am, as you said in the beginning, I am your coach, I'm your concierge, I'm your friend, I'm your teacher, I'm your guide, I'm your mentor. So it is my job to help you or to anyone who needs help. That's my job is to find those services and those things that are going to be best for you. Because when you know better than anyone that when you have the wrong caregivers in place or when you are living in a community that's not right for you, uh, yeah. all, hell, all hell can break loose. Yeah, all hell did break loose. All people watching this go on. And yeah, yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. It was interesting. And I... <laughs> I remember my body, for those of you that um, hadn't um, been around me long enough, you don't know this story. I remember rolling my ankle as I did a podcast. I My dad was all settled. He was all settled. He, it was a Saturday afternoon. I said, okay, I'm going to do this podcast. Will you be okay on oxygen? My stepmom was home. Will you be okay on oxygen if I'm recording a podcast? I remember rolling my ankle. And if that's not a sign of your body breaking down. Yes. And ah, yeah. And I remember and I remember saying publicly, I rolled my ankle. And the two guests were like, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm not okay. I have stuff going on in the background, but I'm not okay. And I don't want to admit it. And that was the worst situation of my life, being my dad's caregiver for nine days. I was trying to be the still rock and do a podcast. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, good. You know, that is such an an important point that you just brought up. And you and I did not rehearse this ahead of time. Yeah. So, and I can't believe how, how much we are connecting here. But you know what? So many caregivers are thrust into the beginning of their journey out of obligation. Uh, oh, and uh, yeah. And I'm going to be honest. And I'm going to say, if you start your caregiving journey out of obligation, you're really setting yourself up for some some turbulent times, for overwhelm, for stress, for burnout, for compassion fatigue. And it's, it's okay if you recognize in your heart that you're not sure if this is working out right. It's okay. It's okay to reach out and talk to somebody like me to see if there are other options. Because you know what, when I believe so deeply that as a caregiver, you can only give as good of care to that person as you are caring for yourself. Yes. Yes. I um, made, and this was only a couple of weeks ago too, I made one of my caregivers go to the ER. I said she got herself in a pickle. And I made her, she fainted as a result. And she said, I'm bleeding. I cracked my head off. And I said, you go to the ER. The next text message I get is, um, I'm at the ER. Someone drove me to the ER. I'm great to pull in here. And I'm like, yeah, if I wouldn't have told you that, you would have been in the was pickle than you were originally. And I'm like, well, 
good thing you texted me. Mm -hmm. Good thing I told you you get to the ER now because mm -hmm. how my main point of story is how are caregivers supposed to take care of others if they don't take care of themselves? Exactly. About that, you guys. Think about that, you guys. How are caregivers supposed to take care of others, including me? And I am not geriatric by any means. I'm just cerebral palsy here. But um, how are caregivers supposed to take care of others if they don't take care of themselves? Mm -hmm. You know what? I really think that um, things are really changing and changing for the good. You know, we've been taught through the years that taking care of yourself first, in other words, like, you, you know, when you're in the airplane, the, uh, you're going to be instructed to put your own right. oxygen mask on first before you help others. It's the same right. thing. We've been taught, though, that taking care of yourself first is selfish. Yep. And and it's not. When can you think of um, a caregiver that you really questioned whether or not they should have, have been in that role? Oh, yeah. Yes. What was that like for you? That was scary because she um, and people people know this. She was actually mean. Part of her personality was actually mean, and she was well. She at the time I was. On a um, state income caregiving situation, and Colorado Medicaid, and people know that I was on Colorado Medicaid, and so part of Colorado Medicaid, they call it person centered plan. I mean, you can hire your own aides, but part of Colorado Medicaid is they do a background check. All these aides have to fill out paperwork, and it was. Um, it was all these. I actually had two aides that didn't uh, that I did not necessarily like. One one got the job and did, couldn't speak English and drove the all of us nuts, including my main caregiver. And then she said to me, "Don't get drunk." When she hands me one glass of wine and in a broken English, she goes, "Don't get drunk." But the second um, aid that I thought was really scary, and I'll admit it, was when she, and she was very slow about filling out her paperwork for the state of Colorado. And it's like, okay, you gotta fill out this paperwork in order to get hired. And she's very slow. And then it comes back as, do you wanna hire this? person we found some icky stuff primarily a DUI and shoplifting mm -hmm. and so of course the DUI didn't sit well with me the shoplifting didn't sit well with my mother and my stepmom and so it's like and she cried when we gave her the phone call that you can't work with when one of my aides said I quit after one month and then because of postpartum depression and getting stuck in the snow. So basically I've had scary. I've also had great aides that stayed with me pretty much to the end and were there on my worst days. I will um, take the good aides. I will also take the okay aides and try and teach them the best I can. But as you said, and I've been thinking about this for the last couple of days since we talked, as you said, are people really in the job of being caregivers? Are they just forced into being caregivers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm gonna take that a step further um, because in your case, it's it's all hired caregivers. Yeah. And when here's how it works. When I work with a family and when it's my responsibility to find caregivers, you know what? 
I'm going to do the interviewing of the home health agencies. I'm going to do the interviewing. And it's made real clear, real fast, and in, in a very loving way, that I'm going to hold you accountable, company, healthcare company. I'm going to hold you accountable. And if I hear something negative from my clients, we're going to chat a little bit further. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Th then the other, the other end too. So not only hired caregivers, but family caregivers. Yeah. There are some, and I, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings and that's not my intent, but some people just shouldn't be a family caregiver. I made it's, for the job. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a tough job. Yeah. And it, not everyone is cut out to be a family caregiver. No. no. And I've had that too. And I've had that, um, my, for those who know me personally, you know, the backstory of my mom and you, um, for those of you that know me via this podcast, you also know the backstory of my mom. My mom was my main aid up until the day she died and she gave it all and tried with the film Lincoln Bite and the other to still be my aide. Yeah, that was a good one. But um, yeah, then we found out that she had a soul we can play in the ism and got that product automatically asked where's when before she named the people in the room, before doctors let her go back to sleep and before doctors left the room, she goes, where's when? <laughs> and who's taking care of when? So, and that, Satan will always make me cry and yeah. yeah, but my mom was a very good caregiver. She knew what um, she, the caregiving aspects entailed. And then I saw the other side of private duty caregiving when I was 16, 17, 14, 15, 16, 17, starting in 2000 with my grandmother because my grandmother got shingles and my grandmother was and would be still to this day if she were alive, um, independent. But she kicked and screamed and got all of us to get to not have private duty caregiving for her and it's like okay you need this you have shingles but it's like interesting because she was so um she was so independent just like i am and she's actually my namesake so grandma was my namesake and this is where i get the independent spirit from this is where i also get the private duty aids from because how grandma did it, I followed grandma's footsteps. So it's either you become a family caregiver or you hire an agency. Mm -hmm. You know what's so interesting and, and what thought you made bubble up when I was listening to you talk about your mom and your grandmother, it really warmed my heart. And you know what made them such awesome caregivers? It was their passion for you. Yeah. They weren't caregiving out of obligation. They weren't caregiving because, well, this is just something that I have to do. Yeah. They, they had a passion for you. And that's what makes the difference. Exactly. A great family caregiver is going to give care because of their passion for that loved one. A, a, a family caregiver is not going to be a good caregiver when they have a sense of obligation. No. And um, I've had young caregivers, um, uh, 18 year olds and 20 year olds taking care of me. And this 18 year old with a little scary down here. And we had witnesses to that. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, are you really in this? job to take you know, humans and yes but also where can the people find you and are you doing this um because i know i have a lot of international listeners mm -hmm. and i know i have 
a lot of United States listeners, are you doing this locally to you or can you reach out and help people in their own states? I know it's different states to say, but can you at least guide people in the right direction? Yes, definitely. So um, let me just prove that really quickly. I can work anywhere in the United States. Okay, It's all remotely, but I can do it. And that's because, you know what, people say, how can you do that when you don't see the people? Well, I never left the hospital. And where my hospital was, it was right along um, an interstate. And so we would have accidents. My longest hospital discharge plan, plan was from um, Wisconsin to China. Oh, so, I, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, yeah. I, I know the job. So, yes, I can help yeah. anyone in the United States. And if someone would like to speak with me internationally, we could make that happen. And I could at least guide you. Yes. I do offer a free 30 minute, I call it a clarity call. And during that call, that's when we decide if working together is going, going to be a good, good fit. Because yeah. I think it's important that I fit together with all of my clients and they fit with me. I think that's just critical. Well, you might get a call from me. Okay. Things you might, if, because I'm watching things change right in front of my eyes. So you might get a call from me if yeah. things get scary with yep. with my agency, which yep. I have now. I have rescued it to get it to a good spot, but you never know. Yeah. You absolutely never. You don't. Know, yeah. Um, where these people are going and where these people are coming from. So where can people find you yep. and where can people get a hold of you? The easiest way to get a hold of me and to find me is um, Google or wh whatever search engine you use. Uh, the name of my company is Midwest Geriatric Consulting Services dot com. Yeah. So um, just Google that. And I've got tons of information under there, a wealth of things that necessarily don't have to do with me, but it's to educate you to see if if hiring a geriatric consultant, consultant is something you should consider. And you can click on any of the little white learn more tabs. They're throughout the website and it'll take you right to um, that free uh, 30 minute clarity call. It's all set up pretty neat, um, pretty uh, well put together. So I look forward to hearing from your guests. Um, I would love to speak with anyone who just wants to talk through, um, should we think about a different um, plan of care? Because really in essence, I help you handle the overwhelming decisions of caring for an aging loved one. That's my job is to help you with that process. And where were you in 2010? Where were you in 2019 when we were like deep in the holes yes. of it? But that's okay. I learned. I learned. For, I learn from the best after I've learned my own experience. And what I learned from the best is how not to do it again. And so that's okay. And so you guys, I think that we have to have. A second episode, maybe a third, because there is so much more detail we can go into. I mean, Jody and I could talk for hours and hours and hours, but I think we're going to have to have a second episode, maybe a third, and Jody and I and Danielle will talk about that, that offline because I, they, um, one thing I want to bring up is when you, get the heebie-jeebies in a nursing home, get your loved one out of that nursing home, or either um, call someone in that nursing home and say, I want to talk to their supervisor. My, the nursing home that my dad was in actually got reported because of the lack of his care, we'll get into that. So maybe I'll get into that story on the next episode with Jody, and maybe we can talk about nursing home abuse, which you see on the news all the time, but when it hits you personally, 
oh boy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And it hit my, it um, hit my, my dad personally, and he was the victim of it. And he also had stage four lung cancer that metastasized everywhere, everywhere in his body. And then he got, he unfortunately passed away of nursing home abuse. And it's scary. So that's my last and the final thought. When you have someone um, in that position and you go and visit them and they don't get bathed every day and they don't, you see telltale signs. And also I'm inviting another friend of mine who is also a medical liaison. And I'm lining that up with her now that I have the space and the time to do it. And so she's also a medical liaison. She is also a caregiving company out here. She runs her own caregiving company. She actually has a book on Amazon about dementia. And so we're going to start, I'm going to start deep diving with the experts here because I want the best quality of life for the disabled at any age. And so that we're going to start deep diving with the experts here because nursing home abuse is something that the nursing homes try and hide, the um, facilities try and hide, and then when the families catch it, and I knew what I was walking into, and I'm like, okay, this is nothing normal because I can see it with my own eyes. And it's like, okay, bad idea, bad yeah. idea. So when you wa are walking into a nursing home, you um, you have to be mindful of yes. what the nurses are doing behind the scenes because a lot of these patients can't talk and are in hospice and do so yep. we'll talk about that on the second episode, but I hope this episode brought to light some of what we all have to go through as we age, and especially some of what I have to go through as a disabled woman. And until next time, I hope you guys enjoy.